Originally in 1980, there were uh, a group of people that I would run into that were getting into music from other countries. It wasn't then called world music. It was very hard to uh, uh, to see in London, and there were maybe two or three record shops that you could find some of these obscure records in. Um, and we thought it would be great to have a, a festival of some sort that would help bring some of these amazing artists to... Um, a rock audience that would normally go to a festival. Uh, before that, they'd been mainly in these sort of cultural events that um, were held often in in the town halls or in uh, city halls, um, and it wasn't relaxed. Uh, so we tried to break up the mold a bit and have a lot of workshops, a lot of things for kids. Um, the kids in the schools were sort of making masks and instruments and um, and the parade, which has become a regular part of Wormont, you know, was a was a fantastic event led by the Burundi drummers. So it was a, an amazing start um, artistically and financially a disaster. But um, Genesis then very generously agreed to do a, a benefit concert because the money required was more than I could muster. Um, and that enabled Boma to continue. I think like any evangelist, we uh, intended world domination from the beginning. But... Um, you know, we were a bunch of idealistic amateurs and uh, wanted to change the world, but didn't really know how to do it. Um, so it was uh, very exciting, really, when we started seeing other countries interested in taking WOMAD. I think the thing that feels great from, from all of our points of view that have been involved is that, that uh, audiences come now based on the name WOMAD. It doesn't really need um, and isn't based around who the headliners are. Uh, and, and it's just an openness. And I think families feel very safe there. They don't always in, in rock festivals. Um, and uh, so it's, I think it's a, a sort of human friendly environment for people to explore all the riches that exist in the world, or at least some of them. Well, I think it's important uh, on all sorts of levels because clearly the music it, it does open it up and also for the musicians who take part. We found very early on that there'd be all these jams going on backstage and a lot of meetings happened at WOMAD festivals that led, led to other groups, um, an Afrocult sound system, for example. Uh, but um, I think more than anything else, it does point out the stupidity of racism. Uh, you start really working with, playing with people from other countries, other cultures. Uh, and uh, I, I know it's been said a million times, but it's painfully obvious when you play music together. New Zealand must feel like heading to the end of the year for many of the performers. Have you had any feedback from New Zealand Women Festivals over the years? Um, I've only had good feedback from New Zealand. I think the, uh, I'm, I'm sure there isn't some negative stuff, but it hasn't come my way. I think people love where it's located. I think it's a very beautiful and relaxed environment. Um, you know, it's been really well supported as well as anywhere by government and uh, um, that, that makes it a, a lot easier too. And uh, um, I think just the nature of uh, the Kiwis and the Kiwi environment uh, make it a very natural home for WOMAD. Along with WOMAD and your real-world commitments, you have been incredibly active in digital media. What do you make of the digital innovations of the last 10 years? Well, I'm very excited by what's happening. I mean, in many ways, the music business is a corpse, but there's lots of really interesting creatures crawling out of it. And uh, you see that um, just in the economics when I started, you know, a record company was unlikely to sign anyone that they didn't think could generate 100,000 in sales. Um, and now, recently we had an incredible string band come to visit the studio, uh, and they'd contacted their database and found, I think, 120 people willing to pay £60 each to watch them record. Um, Consequently, with that money, they were able to make a record, do a video web broadcast, and get themselves back in business. So the point is, you don't need 100,000 to be viable economically. You can be 100. 
And that means that there should be a whole renaissance of experimentation, of collaboration, of people who don't say, oh, I'm just this musician in this band, but I'm, uh, you know, an artist, uh, and I do lots of different projects, try different collaborations. Um, and I think the old sort of real tough lines of property, and I mean, I'm very slow and take ages to do things, but I think at the same time, you know, I get to do a lot of other interesting projects, not always musical. Uh, but I think it, life is going to be more like that for all of us, that we're, there's going to be very few people that are extremely specialised. We still need them, but many more that that um, are able to be jack, jacks of all trades and, and uh, real experimenters and collaborators. Finally, what's your pick for this year's Wormag liner in Taranaki? Would you be lining up to see... What would you be lining up to see if you were there? Um, well, I think there's lots of great stuff there, and uh, I got excited recently with Speed Caravan, um, of this amazing oud player, uh, and uh, like some of the rhythm tracks from Asian Dub Foundation. But it's so some of it's quite hard, but it's I think it's a great mix of traditional and contemporary music. Um, Justin Adams and Jewel De Kamara, Rocchio Traore, um, the Monks. I think there's a lot of great music uh, happening, so I hope you all enjoy. Um, I've only had good feedback from New Zealand. I think the, uh, I'm, I'm sure there isn't some negative stuff, but it hasn't come my way. I think people love where it's located. I think it's a very beautiful and relaxed environment. Um, you know, it's been really well supported as well as anywhere by government and, uh, um, that, that makes it a, a lot easier too. And, uh, um, I think just the nature of uh, the Kiwis and the Kiwi environment uh, make it a very natural home for Womad.